Welcome to the Transform Sales Podcast, where forward-thinking business leaders come to share their experiences and ideas, learn from each other, and amplify their results together. All right, James, and we are live. James, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on, Eddie. Awesome. Great to have you here. James, to give uh, the audience a little bit of context, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you broke into the sales outsourcing industry? Yeah, sure. So I started sales and startups in London in 2017 after many years of being a frontline B2B salesperson. And my experience showed me that as you get more senior in sales, the targets get bigger. You know, 1 million, 3 million, 5 million, 10 million. But the key question for me remained that how do you actually get these revenue targets? How do you achieve them? And that was a really big question that remained unanswered for quite a few of these roles. So when a friend asked me, James, could you help with my four-person tech startup and help me hit my revenue target, I jumped to the chance and resigned from my full-time sales role. All right. I like that. So there's a little bit of uh, growth in the journey, right? In the in the size of the companies or targets that you can be working with. So let me jump into the second question, which is, who are your best fit customers? Is there a specific size that you prefer to work with or a specific vertical or industry? Help me understand that, please. Yeah, sure. So our customers are funded B2B SaaS startups, typically between uh, five to 50 employees. And they have revenues between about 100,000 and 3 million ARR. Okay, perfect. Any particular uh, vertical or or industry that you work uh, with this SMBs or just any any industry is fair game? Yeah, pretty much any uh, industry that B2B, it's more about the stage of company than it is the industry. So we've worked across HR tech, FinTech, logistics tech, you know, idea tech, you know, pretty much you name it. We've got 85 clients. So we've got a really broad range of experience within the technology sector. Okay, 85 different customers. That's great. Now, James, a few seconds ago, before the camera started rolling, we were discussing your services. And let's go ahead and talk about one of those uh, services and success stories. People, rather than hiring you to book appointments, they hire you to almost like a doctor to intervene their sales strategy and sales process. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about the service software that people hire you for the most and some relevant results that you've been able to achieve in the past. Yeah, sure. I like that. The doctor. Uh, often when we're hired by tech companies, they want to double or triple their revenue within 12 to 18 months. So it's how do you do that? And one of the services we offer is called the Revenue Accelerator. It's really focused on closing deals quickly. With startups, cash is king. And they ultimately want to return and they want to see, obviously, that ROI really quickly. So our sort of North Star metric is um, closing deals in terms of sales cycle length. So we look at how long it takes to obviously sign a deal. And because we're dealing with B2B, typically that sales cycle is anywhere between sort of three and 12 months. So we look to shorten, obviously, that length. We have obviously secondary, secondary metrics like um, second meeting to proposal, proposal win rate, um, average deal value, and obviously close one revenue. Um, this is really good for kind of B2B SaaS companies, typically where the founder is still involved in the frontline selling. And, you know, UK, Europe, and US, we've had clients um, and anywhere sort of, again, sort of five to 50 employees and uh, our co-founders or the CEO are often the people that bring us in uh, to help with reducing sales cycle length. Now, um, I have a question. Uh, sorry to cut you, James. I have a question. Yeah. You did mention we work with a lot of tech companies. You did mention the size, at least from a, from a headcount of the companies and the revenue that they should be making. But what about the products that they sell? Uh, is there a specific average deal value, annual contract value that you prefer to work with? Like if it's below that, they're not a good fit, but above that or w within a sweet spot range, what would that be? Yeah, typically the best clients are ones that have a deal value of 20,000 per annum or more. Um, so this is where you've got complex buying cycles, multiple decision makers on a deal. And, you know, one of the case studies I can share with the audience is that 
And we came into a small company, it's about 15 employees. They sold a, a SaaS products to large enterprises. They'd sold to people like Virgin and Sony before. Um, but how did they really um, professionalize their enterprise sales process? They had kind of uh, up and down revenue. The forecasts were often missed. And so it's like, how do we reduce our sales cycle, but ultimately have some predictability in that sales process to increase revenue? So in six months, we were able to cut their enterprise sales process from nine and a half months down to four months, which wow. meant four xing their gross revenue. It also meant that we increased their deal value by 103%. So if you double your deal value, you ultimately get to your goal quite a lot quicker. And also one of the other major stats that we measured is the proposal win rate. So we increased that by 42% within the six months as well. So, you know, if you, if you pit that into a point, we're winning sort of about close to 50% of deals that go through the pipeline. And these are quite large deals in terms of deal value, somewhere between sort of 75 to up to about 125,000 per year was the typical SaaS agreement. Now, from, from what I'm hearing, uh, there's a few different metrics that you influence, James, because as you said, hey, I'm looking for um, business owners or revenue leaders that want to 2x or almost triple the revenue. And there's a few different levers that you can use to push that um, into a better situation, which could be, you mentioned shortening sales cycle, deal value. If you can increase that, of course, you're going to increase your margins. Um, increase the volume, maybe the, the improve the strategy, reduce the friction. And you did mention a few KPIs like, hey, proposal win rate. Those are some conversion rates in the pipeline, close deals. But it sounds like ultimately what you get measured by is the amount of revenue that you can generate by influencing the existing strategies and processes. You don't necessarily close the deals for them, book appointments for them, or create lead lists. You're really just um, doing an intervention on the process to identify levers that you can push. It could be one, it could be multiple, but ultimately the goal or, or how you're going to be measured by mostly is going to be revenue generation. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And that's often what's been a mainstay of our success is that across the 85 SaaS companies that we've worked with, we've got an average revenue increase of 249% per client. So that ranges. You've got obviously people at a slightly higher revenue and people at a slightly lower revenue still, you know, able to sort of two and a half X on average their revenue as well across, you know, 85 clients. So, you know, I think for anyone in sales and looking at a sales provider of choice to increase their revenue, um, it always does fall into those two camps of pipeline and revenue, which is ultimately a conversion exercise when you look at revenue. It's how do you optimize, how do you accelerate sales cycle? We talked about deal value as well. So these are kind of the, like you said, the interventions that we can get to revenue quickly. A uh, pipeline often takes some while to build as well. Um, that could be two, three, four, five months to really see the impact. Whereas we're moving things forward sometimes in a matter of weeks rather than a matter of months. Because if you've got an existing deal in the pipeline and we accelerate that deal towards a close, you're going to see the impact on your bottom line and your top line you know, within weeks rather than months. So we find that that's the best way is that you, know, you, you find those shortcuts to revenue growth first. And then once you've got that mainstay and effective conversion process or sales process, then you can build on top of that and add more to the funnel and increase your pipeline because you know with confidence that those leads will be converted into customers. Gotcha. Now, one of the things that, that I typically ask here is how how many months or how long does it take you to impact the results? But I guess you just answered it. There is no fixed number of months or weeks that is going to take you to uh, increase revenue because it depends on the customer. Basically, what you said is if they have some low hanging fruit in the pipeline, we're going to coach them on how to better convert that sooner, which could have an impact in less than a month. But we're still going to continue to iterate the process to continue to build pipeline because if your sales cycle is six months, you shouldn't be expecting a huge increase in three months because we just started adding more uh, opportunities to the now enhanced pipeline. So 
I guess, to answer my own question, how long does it typically take you to get results is going to vary depending on what they have in the pipeline already versus what you still have to create an influence, but it's most likely going to be aligned with the length of the sales cycle of your buyers, correct? Correct. Yeah, I think sales cycle is the major thing. We're in B2B sales. Um, one of our other clients, the name another success story is that um, they were operating on a uh, per month and kind of what we call per event pricing. So it was like when the customer wants it, they basically bill upon demand. And we switched that to a SaaS model, an annual license model. In the first month, they had 100% of last year's revenue. So then okay. they had 11 months in which to increase their revenue beyond last year. So they'd already hit last year's target in one month because ultimately we changed the pricing terms of the business. And then we signed up all of the existing customers into that new license model as well. So imagine having like your target already confirmed for you know, last year. And now when you think about three or four X in your business, you've got 11 months to do it and you've already made, you know, what you did last year It's incredibly encouraging. And I think, in especially the startup world that we work with, it's about bringing the target closer and optimizing, you know, what you can control first. And then ultimately, you know, you get that momentum and you get that belief that you're doing something that's making an impact, not only in your customers' lives, but also your team feel that confidence as well within themselves. Wonderful. Now, at this point, when it comes to uh, a service offer from an agency, one of the things that buyers typically want to hear is what changes or how do you generate target lead lists? What sequences do we use? But you're not giving them the outcome of here's a deal, here's um, a close opportunity or an appointment set. You're intervening their processes, right? So I guess at that point, the question would be, is there a common denominator for your customers as in, hey, if I intervene your process, you're most likely going to end up with this process for list building and this process for sequence execution? Or is it completely different and, and really ad hoc? Every customer is different. Everyone will have a different uh, sequence. Everyone will have a different uh, process for lead generation or is there a connecting theme we always recommend these databases these processes for duplicating leads let's talk about lead generation just for now when it yeah, comes I, to guiding them is there a, a, a one size fits all or how much do you customize that i think we operate on the basis of frameworks so you have a framework in which to operate it's almost like having guardrails so you don't sort of navigate too far off path Right. right. You know, you're not going to fall off the cliff because you kind of got the flags either side. Right. So that means that we can obviously operate at speed. It means that, yes, we do have frameworks for pipeline building uh, that accelerate that process. And, and it also means the discovery process and finding out what's going to work for the client is quicker as well, because the beauty of our business is that. It's not a one size fits all approach that typically you might see in other sales outsourcing businesses is that your route to revenue might be different from the next client. So we right. do need to identify that. But with pipeline generation, there are definitely frameworks that we use. You know, we build inbound and outbound um, lead generation at our companies. So it's about compounding both of them. It's also about joining the dots of both inbound and outbound together to create a kind of compound growth effect. And then obviously, as we mentioned earlier about in the revenue accelerator example, is that you're obviously building an effective sales process as well. So you've got kind of compound growth on like three fronts you've got inbound outbound lead generation and you've also got you know sales conversion um, improving as well so yeah i think that you know not one single approach is going to be right for every client but we have frameworks obviously to accelerate that progress to show clients like discovery that we go through um you know for example even one of the examples on lead list to just pick up on your example is yeah. that we use a um, SaaS platform that enables us to 
target which type of outreach would be best for that target audience. So you imagine a target list of maybe a thousand, you know, potential prospects in your list. Some will resonate with, for example, email and phone. Some will be phone only. Some will be LinkedIn, phone and email. But you imagine just having the categories of that thousand people and knowing which ones are the phone only, which ones are the email and phone, it, it creates a whole sense of speed and urgency because you're not wasting comms and wasting time on reaching out to people where the medium is not their preferred medium. So right. that's where a lot of people go wrong is that they think that, you know, we do this set process mm -hmm. and that applies to all of the prospects. But you, you know, for example, I might not be a email person. So you do outbound email to me and I will literally never look at that ever. Um, and you've just sent me loads of messages. You've done all the follow ups. You've done the four or five email sequence. You've done now, you know, multiple touches. And it, it just doesn't work for me. Whereas you call me up, you know, that might really work well for me. And I think, wow, OK, this person's, you know, this person's point, they, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn, start a conversation there as well. And, you know, now I'm into a conversation with you as a potential service provider for me. That makes sense. And, and I can tie this back to something that you were saying earlier around your best fit customers. If they have an ADV above $20,000 and they need to have some, uh, let's say, historical records in sales, they need to have $1 million, I believe you mentioned, minimum in revenue yearly. And that is because it seems like a lot of these... Um, a lot of these recommendations do not come, as you said, it's a pre-established process, but rather, I would imagine, a deal analysis. You look into their previous customers. Did we convert an email? Then let's do more email. Did we convert on phone? Then let's do more phone rather than always do phone first, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there are definitely a, a level of deal analysis, which leads me to one question that I missed to ask before, which is you gave me a... a um, high level description of your best fit customers from a company standpoint is there a requirement or some characteristics as in the sales team size is it the same to work with a company of five sales people than one with 20 give me a, a a little bit of clarity there james yeah typically our clients will be quite early stages in building that sales team so i would say they're sort of one to ten reps you know in terms of the sales team is typically what we see but well, we have dealt with, you know, bigger sales teams of 20, 30 reps, but it's like the 80, 20 rule, isn't it? You know, most of our clients fall into the first category. And then obviously we do have some larger clients as well. And just clarifying on the, the 1 million revenue point, typically our clients would have a million or more in funding. Their revenue might be less than that. So we've operated with companies that've got a hundred, two hundred thousand, you know, a revenue, uh, but they've got a million or one point five million in seed funding. So it's more about you know the funding because they've got the ability to invest in you know the people, the processes, you know, obviously test some of these strategies. But if their budget is you know fifty thousand pounds and they're sort of family and friends, you know, bootstrapping it, then obviously one paying for our services is not going to be good ROI. And secondly, right. obviously, you know, putting in place our advice won't be possible either. Right. Now, <clears throat> my next question is around performance reporting. Typically, when an agency is just influencing one outcome, uh, generating lead lists, booking appointments or closing deals, it's just one KPI that is easy to measure. For this type of intervention, I would guess you are reporting on many different metrics, many different conversions, everything along the pipeline. Um, is there any dashboard, anything that you create, or do you intervene and set those up for your buyers? Help me understand what would your next buyer get in terms of reporting and if they were to hire you for this uh, consultation slash intervention package? Yeah, really good question, Eddie. So... We do have a dashboard that is obviously tailored for each client. There's typically sort of seven to eight metrics on that dashboard. There is a bit of variance depending on obviously the sector and the size of that company. Um, but we know obviously the, the kind of long list of metrics that we can share with clients if they're interested as to what could be on that dashboard. Um, but to give a couple of examples, we report weekly on sales velocity. 
Um, so a client would be able to see the, the pipeline and the movement within the pipeline on a weekly basis. Um, and that includes value as well as volume. Uh, looks at like obviously proposals made. Um, we look at obviously the forecast, the activity rate within the last two weeks, which is a massive sales indicator of, of deal um, velocity and also providing proper accurate forecast as well and close dates as well which is often missed is that the close date is almost like the create date is the you know some fictitious date to start with and then as it goes through it's often not updated as well so you know data is very important to us um hence obviously what we do and we set those standards on a weekly basis and we measure that and obviously report on that to clients every week you just touched base on something that is so important. We just discussed deal analysis, right? Looking at your historical numbers to extrapolate who could be your best future customers to go after. And tell me if you found this. When we've done these type of jobs, what we've noticed is that, yeah, looking at your previous customers can help you identify who your best future best customers will be. But the problem is a lot of organizations they don't have well-documented information about their existing customers. You just said the close date is typically the deal creation date, not the day when it was closed, because people don't tend to update. It's a lot of manual work involved. They don't really have accurately documented uh, the space or the vertical or the industry for their buyers, their target uh, industries, their average deal values. So it makes it hard to do a deal analysis. Have you faced this uh, with your customers? Yeah, very much so, Eddie. I think also deal analysis for us, given we work with startups, takes another level on, which the another level on is also the not only propensity to buy, which we do kind of some very sophisticated BI analysis on that. Um, but the second point is often I mentioned is also the time to pay. Mm -hmm. So in startups, obviously, cash flow is really important. So you could sign like a really big deal, like you could sign Sony or Comcast or someone like that, right? Right. But they might take 180 days to pay. Yes. And then you can have a smaller company of maybe 2,000 employees and they pay within 30 days. So you're looking at that and often the deal value is only sort of between 20 to 25% difference. And also you're looking at and thinking, well, you know, the risk there with the 180 days is, you know, a very big risk for me, six months until I receive payment. Um, right. But I'm churning in these really nice kind of large company deals of 30 day payment terms, hitting the bank account. Because as you know, as you grow, kind of growth sucks cash. So you need that cash in which to obviously grow your team, grow your marketing, reinvest, you know, obviously, reinvest obviously that, that return. So that's something that we look at as well within our startups because um, often we're using kind of, and that's obviously the tipping point of our value for our customers is that in effect, they're using revenue-based finance to kind of pay our fees because of the, the growth of the company. It's almost not their baseline cost. It's the increase, obviously, in revenue that they're right. paying us with, which is great. So um, we want to get to that point as quickly as possible. Um, so, yeah, I think propensity to buy and propensity to pay is an interesting point. But then looking at, you know, the days to pay as well um, is another thing that we looked at. One of the big things was um, with a, another example of a SaaS company, the invoice terms was actually when the product went live. And sometimes we estimated that was 47 days after the deal was closed. Wow. And then they had an additional 60 day payment terms as well. So you actually look at 107 days uh, from close day to, to actually get the cash in the bank. So when you look at obviously metrics and investors look at things like cash conversion cycle, which is basically how quickly the money comes into your account, 107 days. And so we immediately took away this whole process of, um, you know, only sending the invoice once they went you know, went go live um, and immediately we wiped off and we even reduced the payment terms down to 30 days and we wiped, we went from 107, you know, to around 28 days, you know, in payment time, which was fantastic, obviously, for a young startup of two, three million turnover. It was a game changer. 
100%. It doesn't seem like these are just services for improving your outbound motions, but overall revenue generating uh, activities, because that right there is just collecting cash. What are we doing on the collecting cash front, which a lot of companies often oversee? They're just putting more in their pipeline rather than what's happening with what we've closed. Are we getting paid on time, et cetera? So that's a very holistic view, which I like. That takes me to my next question, which is, you are there to influence revenue. And, and there's many different levers that you can, many different dials that you can tweak to get there. Um, but when people hire you, is there a performance guarantee? Like, fine, there's so many levers you can tweak that how can I know I'm going to get a result or what happens if I don't? Help me understand any performance guarantees if you do offer them. Yeah, so we give clients, even in the first 30 days where we've analyzed that company, we kind of have a mutual break clause as well where we just walk away from the contract. So we might have signed a six, 12 month contract with that client, um, but we have a kind of immediate break clause, which no you know penalties come from it as well. So that gives you know a lot of companies confidence is that you know if they're not happy with the plan if they're not happy with the route to revenue or they don't think it's possible within their means and within their funding and cash flow mm -hmm. then they can just walk away from the contract uh you know very very quickly i think we had two clients who have done that in six years um so there's not many people that do it and one of them was our choice uh where we basically said the platform the team and the market is not right in order to scale it's this company ready. so we, we we said save your money although they wanted us to continue we said um you know we'll, we'll walk away from this one and actually the founder asked us what we should do um as the next step and kind of got to the point as well that either they raise like three x their funding um get rid of everyone in the team and start with you know the founders again or they just followed the company and make people down and move on to the next venture and they did that two weeks later after our advice so wow. you know then that's the real brunt of you know really advising founders and ceos of companies obviously that wouldn't be for everyone it's not to say that we're gonna give that advice to everyone but it's the reality of our world um so yeah i think performance guarantees you know we, we've got obviously a track record um especially for the clients that are working for six months or longer we'd be very confident in doubling the revenue um mm. so yeah we don't we don't feel we need a performance guarantee because we've just done it so many times it's kind of like you know we could do it but also in the european market often the guarantees um you know process is, is kind of a little bit overlooked um in the us obviously it, it's quite common practice but in europe it's people have a slight sort of hesitation around guarantees because they think oh you know they probably won't give me the money anyway or you know that they won't it will be lots of conditions as well to do the performance guarantee so yeah it's it's not necessary for us really gotcha now, something that I recall um, from uh, a couple months ago, we did a huge event where we brought a lot of sales leaders uh, to Medellin, Colombia to talk about everything around uh, lead generation, growing a company, et cetera. And one of the chats was around getting your agency ready to be sold. But uh, in that conversation, Rash spoke about how you can double or triple revenue. And, and he said, basically, if you identify seven levers and you can just push them 10 percent if you just push seven levers 10 percent, you double your revenue which to your point someone listening in may may hear hey we can double your revenue that's a big claim to fulfill but if you are able to identify those seven points and as we just said it is not just on the um outbound efforts but also on the collecting cash all the revenue ops basically if you can identify seven improve your pricing range improve customer retention reduce sales cycle there's just three right if you can find four more then it's not that hard to just get to that double x or two x increase in revenue so to wrap it up, since there are so many angles in which you can make an influence, you can adjust the process and, and give a positive impact to your customers. If you were to pick three, three tips, let's say, for someone listening to this episode right now and they want to increase the probability of getting the results they want, basically doubling their revenue fast with sales for startups, 
what would be those tips? Yeah, I think our most successful clients have three things in common. One is that they give us full and quick access to all the data. We can't do a proper revenue analysis if you're going to sort of put it behind the iron curtain. So that's really important. So we can get to grips with exactly what is the quickest route to increase revenue. Uh, the second one is response times. Really small kind of tactical one, but makes a big, oh. big difference in startups is that, you know, you, you're iterating, you're changing things, but often there's, you know, delays and people don't see the value of coming back to you on certain offers or certain changes. And that creates a real lethargy, you know, within those companies. And then the final one is introducing us as part of the team, not just consultants. And that's a, a very nice way that my team and also your business will be respected and cherished as it should be, um, because you know we're wanting to sort of double or triple the revenue of your company. We're not going to do that from standing afar on some ivory tower. You know we want to get into the, you know, into the roots and into the, the battlefield and, and see exactly what's going to make the changes that are going to increase your revenue. So yeah, we're not. We're not one to be kept at arm's length, that's for sure. <laughs> so, and yeah, hopefully those three were helpful. That is very important as in, uh, at least for the mindset that the hiring team should have. Uh, a lot of times people think, hey, just throw money at an issue, hire a couple of buddies, throw them at the issue, it, it should get fixed. But don't get them involved too much. They're still outsourced. When in reality, to recap your three, your three recommendations, number one, access to key data, I would say this is almost like having trust. You're hiring yeah. me, trust me, give me what I need to deliver the impact that you want me to deliver. So trust me. Number two, response time. Yes, you're giving me the information, you're giving me the answers, but if you give them to me a week later, there's only so much I can do. You got to strike when the iron's hot. So definitely timely um, feedback, bi-directional communication is key. And the last one, introducing you as part of the team. I've seen so many uh, engagements where outsource or external help is brought on to, to assist the team and either is not introduced correctly, is perceived as a threat to the existing team, and overall it doesn't lead to the collaboration that gets the buyer the results they were looking for just because they didn't invest that little bit of time of introducing them correctly to the team and say, hey guys, don't be threatened by them. Actually be open, be transparent, share everything where it aches, where we are having some pain because they are the doctors, right? As I, we started the episode, these doctors are here to help us not to, to work against us. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense. Appreciate that, James. It's been a great episode. So to recap, if you are a tech company, you want to grow revenue, and you believe that there are many places in your sales structure that could use some intervention, some levers that there can definitely be some tweaks, both on messaging processes, um, standard operational procedures, let's say, then you should be looking and considering sales for startups. Um, any other recommendation, anything else you want to share with the audience, James? I think... Often one thing that a lot of founders get wrong is you mentioned about hiring lots of bodies. It's very tempting to just try and sort of devolve yourself from the problem, go and hire a VP of sales, you know, go and hire a couple of sales reps and hope that, you know, these people will certainly sort of create some magic solution and be the pill to all your problems. But one thing I've learned with 85 startups is that often identifying the root cause of the problem, you know, creates so much speed later on and can ultimately increase your revenue rapidly. So don't go out and hire lots of people, especially if you're not quite sure as to what the route forward is. You may have some inkling, you may have some ideas, but don't just jump in and, you know, invest hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, trying to hire some people that, have created some point that they're going to sort of create a solution to all your problems. You know, that's that's often not the case. And they're often very good at selling themselves, you know, rather than selling your product as well. So bear that in mind too. And you're going to waste your budget there because then you're not going to be able to afford the intervention that you really needed. Um, awesome. James, I appreciate your time. appreciate everything that you share with our community. 
team. If you want to work with Salesforce startups and James' team, you can find them in the Cloudtos Marketplace. James, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Eddie. Awesome team. There you have it. Stay tuned. See you on the next one.